So we, we typically do at the very beginning, uh, we just ask some warm up questions to our guests and these won't appear in the, the actual finished episode, but we do extract them for something that we're calling meet the scientist. So they're, you know, somewhat more personal questions uh, just, just to get going on the conversation. I mean, we're kind of already going on the conversation, but uh, since we haven't been recording, let's do these anyway. Um, and the, the, one of the questions we really love is, is to ask, uh, if you could bring back a dead scientist and have a beer with him or her, who would it be and what would you talk about? And it's okay to say Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, good, good, good. No, Wallace. Fantastic. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> Wallace, Wallace, Wallace is my hero. Wallace was a working class guy. Um, I mean, he went really, he lived, he lived a long time and in his last decade was not his best um, in terms of the seances and the crazy loopy stuff. But, <laughs> but, but as a young man, what an inspiration, you know, I, I, as Art knows, I grew up a butterfly fanatic. And, you know, so I read all about Wallace and Bates and, and Mueller and like how they discovered mimicry. And, and when I was 22, you know, and going off to Mexico and, and Ecuador to, to do butterfly surveys, like I was the same age as those guys, you know? And, you know, we have this kind of old man with a long beard idea about great scientists, but like most discoveries are made by young people in their twenties mm -hmm. mm -hmm. who are hungry as hell. Mm -hmm. and, and Wallace like epitomized that. He was this, you know, poor, incredibly motivated, brilliant guy um, who, who, who sold specimens to support himself. He was almost a mercenary collector, but you know, his whole thing was, I've got to get to the places where biodiversity is. I've got to be able to, and, and so his, that story is so compelling about how he and Bates, how he and Henry Bates like traveled together to Brazil. And then like they spent three years together and then they split up, you know, you go up the Rio Negro and I'll go up the Orinoco or whatever it was. And then, you know, on his way home, like, it all went down in the shipwreck. Like most people would have just like said, all right, I'm done. <laughs> you know, I'll, 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 I'll marry somebody in the countryside and, you know, Wedgwood, <laughs> Wedgwood ceramics and all of that. No, like he went and taught school for a year, raised funds and went back to the Malay archipelago. And we have that to thank yeah, for, yeah. you know, pushing Darwin to publish. Yeah. But Wallace, did, did, how, how old was Wallace when he wrote to Darwin and, and, and developed his own ideas about? I don't remember, selection. but if, <laughs> But I'm, I'm going to say he had to be still a young guy. He was like he had to be less than 40. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say early 30s or late 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you know, like he was in a malarial, he was in a malarial yeah. fever at the time, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I bring back Wallace. Uh, the, that conversation will go on for hours. Um, <laughs> and and we've all met people like that, you know. Phil, yeah. De, Phil DeVries. When I was a young guy, Phil DeVries for me was just an incredible friend and an inspiring colleague and somebody who, you know, like Bates or Wallace, just sort of up and went to Costa Rica for yeah. whatever, a decade of his life. And I, I used to love talking to Phil, um, picking his brain. And you're like, when you meet somebody who shares your love for natural history, it's like a brother you know, right. or a sister. Yeah. What do you think Wallace would be most excited about in say the last 20, 30 years of biology? Well, it's a great question. Um, I think- what, what would he write his first grant proposal on? <laughs> I think symbiosis. Yeah. You know, I, I think because he was so interested in 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 speciation and diversity and 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 different and island biogeography, which is what he's really famous for to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, and sort of islands within islands within islands would you know as the yeah, father of blow his mind <laughs> as the father of a discipline. Right. Like taking that idea, which is crucial to what we're going to talk about later in terms yeah. of you know the. How does gene flow and isolation affect, you know, coevolution? Uh -huh. He would have been That's all right over. there. Yeah, yeah. And because he was a polymath, like you know, he loved beetles too, and you know, he knew that beetles were communities. The beetles are covered with mites. They're covered with pseudoscorpions. Inside of those creatures, there are bacteria and yeasts. Mm -hmm. You know that 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 when a harlequin beetle flies from a saber tree to another saber tree, it's a bus. Yeah. Right. And so he would have been all over that if he yeah. could have like if he could have worked. If he could have tromped across Faro, Colorado Island, and then got back into a lab and isolated, 
you know, the microbiome of Harlequin beetles, I think he would have been a happy guy. <laughs> the thought of, of Wallace working there with a pipette, you know, running some PCR. I, I don't know. I can't get that image right in my head. That just seems the opposite. Shit, my to, reaction didn't work again. <laughs> yes, exactly. Afraid of the PCR guys. All right. So, so another real quick softball, and then we'll move on to the heavy duty stuff. What's your favorite flower? in the world and by the way jinkia planted this question yes this is planted oh is that a dad joke (laughs) you know you know why don't start (laughs) (laughs) you you know why he did that is 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 because when i went out when when he agreed to come to graduate school with me i told him i was going to make him a botanist and you know (laughs) and now he's produced this like beautiful chapter one of his thesis which is all about you know datura humidity um so i'm gonna say I've got, you know, Georgia O'Keeffe's painting up on my wall here. Um, I've got to say, you know, the um, sacred datura. Okay. Awesome. Sacred okay. datura. It, it, because for me, it's not just that it's from, from a sensory point of view and from an aesthetic point of view, it's a, it's a marvel of mm-hmm. the world. I have a mm-hmm. hundred favorite flowers, um, but, but it also for me is, is, is this cornucopia of, you know, my career. That, that mm-hmm. when I moved to Arizona for my um, postdoc, Mm-hmm. That that flower, more than anything else, kind of launched me into integrative and comparative things. You know, I wasn't a behaviorist as a graduate student. I studied the genetics of volatile production in Clarkia flowers. And mm-hmm. I was very focused. It was a very reductionist thesis. I love Clarkia brewery, don't get me wrong. But, you know, it's a magnificent flower. But for me, that, when I look at the, the, the sacred datura, the Jimson weed, in any rendition, whether Georgia O'Keeffe's or whether you know Moonlit in Tucson, you know at the Sonoran Desert Museum, yeah, it, it just moves me, yeah. uh, it, in a way that is not sort of scientifically bounded. Yeah. Um, and inspiration is half of what we're talking about today. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna go with that. Totally. Okay, okay, sounds good. All right, so let's move into the the, the material. Rob, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the show today. We really appreciate it. We've got a lot of ground to cover, um, but let's start with, let's hope it's a softball. Um, it's a big open-ended sort of concept, but um, there's really no way to answer it incorrectly. What's coevolution and how is it different from, if there is such a thing, regular old evolution? <laughs> Well, that's that's a great topic for a mini series. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll just so, change the podcast in six evolution. hours here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, for, and from people better than me. Um, but I, I, I'll say one of the interesting aspects of, of the answer to your question is what isn't coevolution. I would say that there's a lot of you know, Mark Rauscher, Dan Jans, and lots of like real pioneers in our field. You know, uh, James Thompson. You know, have had formative contributions to the idea of like, when is it coevolution? When is it not? Um, you know, it's, it starts with Ehrlich and Raven in 1964, the year before I was born, mm-hmm. who came up, who had this brilliant insight that writ large looking at biotas, you know, that there were these really non-random special relationships between lineages of plants and lineages of insects that eat those plants. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and, and each of them, young scientists at the time, but encyclopedic biologists, you know, the broad knowledge of butterflies that eat plants, you know, different plant families that have different kind of secondary chemistry that makes them, you know, well known to us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, so their image of coevolution was this idea that um, organisms can enter into relationships where the mutual selective pressures upon each other are intense. Mm-hmm, so an, mm-hmm. an herbivore eating a plant could kill that plant. It, it, could, it could eat the flowers and fruits. It could defoliate it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so it, it, other, in other words, directly affecting its fitness, its survivorship and its fecundity. Um, mm-hmm. you, conversely, um, if that plant is a host plant, you know, the, and if it fights back and kills um, the progeny of a butterfly laying eggs on, say, a passion flower plant. Um, that's that's going to, you know, that's a direct hit to your fitness, right? If your okay. eggs hatch into larvae that cannot handle those leaves, you know, you're not going to leave more descendants. You know, very right. sort of base Dar- Darwinism 101. Right. You know, so 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 strict coevolution um, is the idea that you have reciprocal selective pressures that lead to, you know, diversification. Okay. So, lead to a whole lineage of plants that have alkaloids or have cyanogens or have 
saponins or have you know, different kinds of defense chemistry, for mm -hmm. example. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have lineages of animals that interact with them that have counter adaptations to deal with or detoxify or sequester uh, those attempts to you know, kind of disrupt the relationship. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, coevolution isn't always antagonistic, right? Coevolution isn't always about um, plants versus herbivores or uh, animals, you know, prey versus their predators. Coevolution right. doesn't, doesn't have to be plant insect, right? Um, it could be between uh, flowering plants and their pollinators or plants, you know, that produce fruits and, the, and their dispersal agents. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of reciprocal cooperati cooperativity. Uh, that, that's uh, right. So, so I would say that the early take home message of the idea of coevolution was the, you know, these textbook examples of highly co-adapted organisms whose phenotypes, whose morphologies, you know, whose traits reflect the, the, that co-adaptation. And one of the outcomes, especially when there's an antagonistic relationship is the idea of an arms race. Yeah. Um, so, so think about it, right? It's the mid sixties, early seventies. <laughs> what's going Prominent on in the, in the mind? Yes. <laughs> what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. right? It's nuclear, you know, nuclear escalation and mm -hmm. arms races and things. So, so I, I, I try to be very humble uh, about science being kind of, um, you know, search for truth that isn't impacted by, you know, the social constructs around us. Uh, and there's volumes and volumes of books written about yeah. how politics and, 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 and social theory uh, and, and philosophy uh, uh, and culture affects the way scientists ask questions mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and paradigms. You know, mm -hmm. ecology, for example, the importance of competition versus mm -hmm. cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, so just, just to keep this brief, like that, that's, that was sort of the beginning paradigm of coevolution. And um, for 20 or 30 years, there was a very sort of active field of people asking, well, when is it coevolution? What's diffuse coevolution rather than tit for tat, you know, yeah. highly specific coevolution? When is it not coevolution? Can't we just say things are, you know, adapted to each other? And is it useful as a heuristic, you know, to, 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 to just put up those barriers? Right. Now, is it, is it something special about coevolution? What was, what was Ehrlich and Ravens or, you know, subsequent research, their motivation for naming it relative to say evolution by natural selection? The conspicuous thing is if an organism a lineage is responding to some part of the environment that doesn't have the propensity for, you know, reciprocal evolution, whether whatever it might be can be a strong selective event, but the weather is not going to change depending on, you know, how long the bird's wings are, uh, are getting. But is it just that observation that motivated it? Or is it something about the outcome, sort of the rate at which evolution happens or the propensity for, like you said, diversification to happen? Was it I, that that sort of sets it apart and motivated Ehrlich and Rabin to distinguish it from evolution by natural selection? Very, yeah, that's, that's very good. That That's the key. That, that One of the key ideas coming out of that early paper was the idea of escape and radiation. You know, so the idea is that if you, if you, if this arms race of, 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 of mutual selective pressures leads you to a key innovation, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a, a compound like tetrodotoxin, okay, this, this, this amazing blocker of ion channels, right, that's, that, 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 you know, fugu fish have, mm -hmm. you know, that, that is a mover and shaker across the planet. Um, you know, the Brodies work on newts and, and, and um, garter snakes, for example, is all about how can you handle tetrodotoxin? What does it do? Is it, it's, a, it's a game changer for nervous systems, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so if, you, if the coevolutionary arms race leads you to a key innovation, a new kind of toxin that only specialists can detoxify, then you're in a new adaptive zone. You know, then you're free to enter new niches. It's like you know, cichlid fish in Lake Malawi. Like yeah. once, once the ancestral cichlid got there, all the, all the niches were open, mm -hmm. right? And so it's the diversification rates. So if you go into the broader evolutionary literature and look at key innovations, you know, Scott Hodges did some beautiful work on nectar spurs and like our, our lineages of plants that, that evolve nectar spurs, are they more species rich than, than their sister, you know, lineages that don't have them? The answer is a resounding yes. And you could think of things like wings and eyes, uh, you know, glands that, that, that you know, reduce, remove salt from water you know, all kinds of, of key innovations that organisms have mm -hmm. um, that then lead to lineages that explode 
in terms of the diversification rates. Mm -hmm. So Ehrlich and Raven provided a mechanism, potential mechanism for, their, you know, why are there almost 500 species of passion flower vines? You know, it's because they're cyan, probably because they're cyanogenic and that gives them a leg up on most generalized you know, herbivores. And they've just got to contend with the specialized beetles and long wing butterflies, et cetera, that can handle them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And so, question about Ehrlich and Raven's paper. I mean, it's become such a landmark in, in thinking about coevolution. And um, so it sounds like these ideas were in the air already uh, in, in many different respects. So what was it about that paper, do you think, that just crystallized the idea for so many people? I, I think the explanatory power, um, you know, something that Ehrlich and Raven individually were very, very good at across their long careers was gathering huge amounts of diffuse data that were the province of individual specialists and, 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 and synthesizing them and saying, yeah. you know, look at the, I, mean, I, I can't even do justice to those gentlemen's careers, right? But, you know, Peter Raven also had a real interest in biogeography. Mm -hmm. you know, he's somebody who, you know, Axelrod and Raven looked at, looked at you know, the, the continental patterns of, of, of floras yeah. and said, like, how did they, you know, how did, how, why are plants shared between China and you know the Smoky Mountains, you know Eastern North America. You know what? what how about the Madrean flora that we know and love from the American Southwest? Um, yeah. but that, but that is a is a shadow of the deeper richness of the Sierra Madre, you know, biota in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so, like those guys just had the capacity mm -hmm. to to ask big questions. You know, art. It's something that you and I benefited from by by having part of our education, be it Stanford, is that it was a department where people regardless of what level of, of organization they worked on, you know, we're really pushing big mm -hmm. formative questions mm -hmm. rather than detail questions. The thing that amazes me about the Ehrlich and Raven paper is, you know, it's got these kind of big long taxonomic lists and uh, of stuff that they use to bolster their case. And, and it, it feels like they've just found all these tiny little puzzle pieces and they put <laughs> them all together into this giant holistic view that is just so rare in, in papers, so. It helped. I have to say, it helped me as I was, as an undergraduate. I was working with Charles Remington at Yale, and I was a butterfly collector. I wasn't a scientist yet, and that's the first paper he asked me to read. Huh. Um, you know, as a freshman in in college, and like my head exploded. I thought, oh my god, like now I now I can look at the collection at the Peabody and and understand patterns in it. You know, and and how yeah. Charles had actually that collection wasn't random. That collection was all about you know, biogeography, all about coevolution, all about chemical defense, all about, you know, islands and local adaptation. Yeah. So I think it, as an organizer of thoughts, you know, the, the next step, of course, is you can say, well, it's not just about butterflies or plants. You don't have to care if you're a marine biologist. Yeah, sort of generalizing yeah, the whole it's idea. A gen yeah. It's a very general yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, that paper was, <clears throat> it's one of the one that really sticks out to me from my my graduate school. We were required as graduate students to take the, the foundational papers is a series of three in behavior, evolution, and ecology. And this one was obviously in the, in the evolutionary section. Of the 50 in that class, I could probably name 10 of them, and, but the Ehrlich and Raven is one that really stands out prominently. And really, I've never done research in that area at all. So it just has a, had, had a strong impact. Um, so Rob, we want to sort of continue to talk about coevolution and then maybe get a little bit into the nuts and bolts en route to the, the research that you've been doing um, in the recent past. But can I take a, a brief diversion here in light of what we've been discussing and ask if we know anything, we juxtapose natural selection and coevolution or evolution by natural selection and coevolution. Do we know anything about the players in coevolutionary relationships such that the traits of those, you know, uh, that duo or we'll get into more complicated organizations later. Is there anything about the traits of them that dispose higher rates of diversification or just rates of evolution in general. And you, you mentioned a minute ago, um, or you alluded to the Red Queen hypothesis, right? And so that's classic from Lewis Carroll, running as fast as you can to stay in the same place. And that's usually invoked for the arms races. And in particular, my world, it's a disease ecology type of argument. But is there anything like the body size disparities between two players in a relationship or the ecologies or the evolutionary histories that influence subsequent diversification? Any of the outcomes of coevolution? Yeah, there's, you know, and I'm I'm not expert at that. I, th I think that you know my my colleagues in, um, you know, in microbial symbiosis, you know, people like Angela Douglas and Teresa Pavlovska, 
um, mm -hmm. here at Cornell, who I teach with and who I know well, um, you know, they have been driving a lot of that concept structure and, and, and you know, especially working in microbial uh, symbiotic relationships as they both do, um, you know, where we get into the red king as well as the red queen. <laughs> but this idea that if you're in a really tightly co-adapted mutualistic relationship, maybe you don't, you know, you know maybe, maybe the, the, the pressures are not to evolve really quickly, right? But to, yeah. but to, but to, to track each other and, and yep. make sure that the, the checks and balances are working but don't go off the planet in terms of the co-adapted, you know, gene clusters. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Whereas if you have an antagonistic, you know, relationship, you are red queening, right? You're, you're chasing yeah. each other. You know, uh, I think the famous example is, you know, Kurt Lively's, you know, from Indiana's work on parasites, you know, driving the evolution of sexual reproduction, you know, in snails mm -hmm, uh, in, mm -hmm. in New Zealand. And this is one of the examples that we teach, right? That in uh, and this is getting toward the geographic mosaic idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, self, self uh, suggestion there. No, um, no problem. That's where we were going. We're, so you're we're, doing well. <laughs> we're on the path. <laughs> we're on the path. Yeah. So, so right in, in, in places where parasitism rates are high by trematode worms or whatever, the poor snails, like there's no snail on the planet that's, yeah. you know, that's free of a, of a parasite, I guess. But, um, you know, when, when the parasitism rates are really high, uh, there's a really strong selective pressure on, on, on recombination, right? On sex. You, you've got to like increase the rate of 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 counter you know counter adaptation to to, to these guys that are like neutering you and, and mm -hmm. killing you or getting you eaten by by birds so that they can repeat you know complete their life cycles mm -hmm. uh, and in places where that's lower uh, where those selective pressures are lower there are advantages to you know to not having sexual reproduction yeah yeah, um, yeah. and that, that's like like deep in the foundations of you know behavioral ecology and, and evolutionary theory of like the advantages and disadvantages of sex. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I think coevolution has a direct input on like that discussion and that conversation as well. And maybe okay. maybe that makes it more interesting in the sense that it's not just like if if plant pollinator or plant herbivore evolution isn't your thing, um, coevolution is still like hyper relevant to all these <laughs> other aspects, you know, of uh, epidemiology, for example. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> leading completing the banner year for epidemiology mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and co-evolution is all about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just, just for our listeners, we, we've thrown around this metaphor of the red queen a couple of times. <clears throat> can, can you just unpack that for a sec? Uh, oh, oh right. Everybody know? Yeah. So, so there's a quote from Lewis Carroll's book uh, that, you know, uh, you know, here in our world, uh, you have to run as fast as you can to stay in the same place. Yeah. Right. And, and so, you know, Lee Van Valen, I guess when I was about five or six, you know, years old, um, you know, not not a member of the rock group Van Halen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Alas, Van Valen, not Van Halen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he, <laughs> he played, rhythm, played rhythm guitar. That's a great rhythm, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? Running as fast as he can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like Angus Young, uh, <laughs> ACDC on the floor. Um, no, no, Lee Van Valen popularized this idea that that. Um, you know, those selective pressures are so ferocious that, um, you know, you might not see the net result as, as, as change in phenotype. What you might see is, is, you know, the lack of extinction, you know, or the lack of destruction because the, the, the counter adaptation and adaptation, you know, selective pressures are so intense. Yeah. So um, both parties are evolving so fast just to stay where they are. In that yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting that that was published in the early seventies before we had you know, modern genomic science and PCR and, and, and genetic medicine. Like, so now we can look at in our lifetimes, gentlemen, you know, like how has HIV changed, mm -hmm. right? How yeah. have, you know, some of the diseases that when in the 1980s, when we were students, or at least when I was a student, you know, were terrifying, right? The, the mortality rates, you know, the virulence rates, and like they've changed in real time. And we can look at the sequences and say, and track all those lineages and say, okay, mm -hmm. You know, here's how this one slowed down. Here's how this shifted. Here's how this jumped host, um, which is what you know COVID's been all about as well. Mm -hmm. So when we teach yeah, totally. these ideas in our class, it's 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 very poignant. You know, for, it's, it's, it, for our students, especially in the last year, um, that that animal, the study of animal behavior and evolution and coevolution is actually you know a really strong endorsement for veterinary science or for mm -hmm. you know epidemiology or working for the CDC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great point. Well, let's um, want to unpack one more point that we've thrown around a little bit, and, and that's this distinction between 
uh, one to one coevolution than diffuse coevolution. And, and just for me personally, you know, I think maybe for many people, it's easy to imagine one to one coevolution. You know, one lineage evolves a, some, some novel variation of a trait, uh, the other lineage responds. But there's also this sort of concept of diffuse coevolution, which involves, you know, multiple lineages in the community interacting and influencing each other's evolution. So, so how do you, how do you bridge that gap from thinking mechanistically about one-to-one -to, -one to diffuse? Yeah. I, I'd say the, the two word answer would be community ecology. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but let me go back to Darwin and Wallace, and this is a bridge to night blooming flowers, which is what mm -hmm. I do. Uh, so every textbook on, on evolution has Lutz Wasserthal's beautiful photo of, um, Xanthopan and Morganai with his, you know, 22 centimeter tongue, uh, hawk, giant hawk moth in Madagascar visiting, you know, Darwin star orchid and Greekum sesquipedale. And so this was the, you know, the, the, the flagship example of, uh, you know, tight coevolution uh, in a pollination scenario, right? <clears throat> that Darwin posited that it would be select, you know, directional selection on the flower to have a longer spur so that the moth would press its body into the flower and increase the probability of, of transferring a, a pollen package, right? A pollinium. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, but then like the longer the, you know, the, but if the moth was depending on that flower for nectar, because, you know, as, as Art and I know in excruciating detail, you know, the, <laughs> the, the energetic demands on hawk moths are like, they're Olympic athletes, right? They're burning fuel at unbelievable rates. Uh, to, to, to be hovering in flight at from two yeah. to two. Homeotherms, 40 degree thorax, uh, yeah. Unbelievable, right? So, so they need high octane fuels and they get them from flower nectar. Uh, so they're alone, right? Like there's a prediction for like, what's the optimum fuel for these guys? And you could get into a dissertation on that. But mm -hmm. um, what, you know, what's fascinating is, uh, you know, if you go to Madagascar, first of all, those orchids are not very abundant. And even before deforestation, they weren't very abundant. And second of all, they don't bloom for very long. You know, so in terms of supporting a population of hawk moth adults, for, you know, in terms of grams of sugar or, or joules of calories, like they're insufficient, mm -hmm. okay? So that doesn't make sense as a tight coevolutionary relationship. What makes more sense is that those orchids are part of a guild of night blooming flowers that provide hawk moths across biomes in, because hawk moths are, are really fragile. They can fly across islands. They can fly mm -hmm. across bodies of water. They're not limited to one forest in most cases. Um, and they need fuel every night. They, they, they're not territorial. They don't come back to where they were born. You know, so they need to find food and they're very good at doing it. Um, but it ends up that if you ask them where they go for food, what they really like is a baobab tree. You know, mm -hmm. for the whole, the whole canopy has been bloomed with these giant, you know, puff balls of flowers full of grams of nectar and they don't have to they don't have to, have to work the, hard for it huh? no they can <laughs> they can fill their nectar crops you know a half an ml of sugar and then get on with what they want to do which is find mates and lay eggs mm -hmm. so so you know the pollinator shift idea is that uh darwin star orchid may be you know tapping into a platonic ideal you know some kind mm -hmm. of sensory bias of what hawk moths really love yeah mm -hmm. You know, you know, Jeff Riffle did a really nice experiment in Arizona where he asked, you know, if, if, if Manduca sexta, our moth, the tobacco hornworm, you know, it visits agave flowers in the, in the desert. We know this because it's covered with agave pollen when we catch the moths. But it has this really great relationship with Datura flowers because it lays eggs on them as a host and it also drinks sugar and pollinates them whenever you look at them, mm -hmm. you know. And so what Jeff and, and his colleagues found at, at the University of Arizona is they have an innate preference for detura. And so if you give a naive moth a choice between detura and agave, it'll almost always choose detura. But once it's learned agave, it'll go to agave flowers because it's learned, hey, this is, you know, this is a Pavlovian this situation. <laughs> this but in some good... ways that, that doesn't explain why they evolve such long proboscides, right? Like long tongues. Because if they can get their food from other super abundant sources, then it seems like there'd be very little selection pressure necessarily to to yeah. exploit these sort of rarer but but preferred sources. So what explains so, that? Yeah, so 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 that's the the virtue of of alternative hypotheses. You know, sometimes you know break <laughs> huh. break break out of the textbook, right? So so 1997, um, there was this paper by a guy from Minnesota named Bill Miller in the Journal of Lepidoptera Society. Uh, I don't know how many people read it, but I, it blew me away because Bill basically said, "Here's an alternative view." Uh, 
Uh, not all hawk moths visit flowers. Uh, in fact, a large, a large number of them never don't even feed as adults. <clears throat> and what's interesting is the ones that don't feed as adults and have like vestigial mouth parts tend to feed on trees as larvae, as caterpillars. And, and they pupate beneath the tree and the tree is always there. You know, when, it, when that pupa emerges, whether it's the next year or the following year, the tree, the ash tree is gonna be above it, right? So it doesn't, basically it doesn't even have to fly, right? It just gets out of the pupa, goes up, you know, if it's a female, it put, puts out its pheromone, males find them, they mate, life cycle complete, mm. right? Whereas the species that have long tongues tend to feed on herbaceous plants. And the, and the interesting thing about herbaceous plants is that they're variable in space and time, right? That, that's, that's Paul Feeney's idea of, of, of apparency, right? So mm -hmm. if, if you're a manduka moth and you, and you eat a datura plant or a tomato plant or whatever as a larva, and you come out as a, in front of your pupa the next year as an adult, maybe it's not there. You know, maybe you have to fly a kilometer to find the next plant. And so Bill Miller's idea, which is brilliant, I thought, is that give, having long tongues means that you can get food from, and you can get nectar from basically any flower. I got it. So it's kind of like and, a bed hedging sort of thing. It, it allows yeah. you to, to feed out yeah. on the extremes if only the extremes are available. Yeah, so, so, awesome. so, so Vasatol said, you know, hey, maybe that's what's going on with Darwin's orchid. That, that maybe Darwin's orchid is pollinator shifting onto moths that have really long tongues that visit baobabs or something else on Madagascar, mm -hmm. and they're taking advantage of them. I mean, there still could be some coevolution or some some adapt, you know, one-sided evolution from the from the orchid, you know, making a longer spur so that they yeah. you know, get pollinated better. Um, mm -hmm. But it's but it's different than the than the than the escalating arms race, right? Where right. where you would predict that every you know fifth generation of moth would have a longer tongue. Yeah. And, and, that, and, that, and that can happen, right? It, especially mm -hmm. on an island, um, but it's nice to have alternative hypotheses. Yeah, for sure. And I think, and, you know, when we, when we <laughs> do, when, when we, you know, here's like, this is also the great age of <clears throat> unbiased, untargeted, you know, experiments, right? Where, where we say, Let, let's collect the microbiome from the soil and ask what it's doing rather than saying, I'm only looking for this microbe and I'm going to find it wherever it is. And in, in, in this case, you know, what, what Ruben, Ruben Alarcon did, you know, in Arizona was, uh, you know, he and, and Gagi Davidovich and Judy Bronstein, you know, did this wonderful uh, survey where they collected moths from light traps and they took pollen off their bodies. They were, you know, agnostic about it. They just basically said, you know, from a what forensic are they point, yeah. where are they going? Ask them. Where have you, where have you been? And they took the pollen off their bodies and, and, they, and they had reference specimens and identified you know, and, and it was, sh and some of the results were shocking. Like males and females go to different flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't, they're not constrained by syndromes that go into, in some cases, like the most abundant thing out there, you know, which is, um, you know, a plant that they shouldn't be visiting because there's no nectar in it. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Or, or maybe there is, like we don't know. <laughs> but, 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 but it, you know, wherever that's done in the world, you get this much broader view um, that, 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 even though there certainly is specialization out there, I would never say that there isn't. So it sort of leads naturally to this idea of diffuse coevolution because yeah, both yeah, parties are interacting with so many different species. Yeah. That's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and going great. to and, you know going to going to South Africa, um, you know, for my first sabbatical, I got to see that. You know, I, I worked with Steve Johnson, who's a good friend, you know, brilliant, brilliant pollination biologist and evolutionary biologist. And you know, South Africa, is, as as you probably know, wasn't glaciated, right? It's it's, it's a it's a very old place in terms of its, its biomes and its habitats. Uh, and so there's a lot of specialization in South Africa. Um, it wasn't white clean by the Laurentides mm -hmm. ice, ice sheet or by, or, or by the, you know, the European ice sheets. And, mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, you can work in a, in a, in a, in a grassland in, in, in Eastern South Africa and see really specialized milkweeds that if you planted them in North America would be, would have generalized pollination, right? But in South Africa, they have you know one or two species of beetles or wasps that pollinate them and, and other things don't. Mm. And Steve and I spent a lot of time talking about, well, why is that? Is that because of diffuse coevolution or is it because the plants are actually filtering who their visitors are by putting toxins in their nectar or, or by making the flowers into kind of Rubik's cubes that mm. only certain kinds of animals can, can access mm. if they have- Nice the alternative right. hypotheses. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was, I mean, it was really stimulating. Yeah, yeah, great. I, you know, every every episode, we're reminded at how damn complicated 
biology is. <laughs> I mean, we you start off with this. Sort of, now. <laughs> I know, let's just give up. It's just no, no, no closure. It's just more questions than answers. But um, this this idea about diffuse coevolution is is so interesting because it it forces you to confront the the sort of scales of time that are, are always so important in biology. Um, and I, I think we're sort of dancing around the other dimension of complexity that that you you mentioned just briefly a minute ago, Rob, is this sort of classic geographic mosaic mosaic theory of coevolution. So it's not just that you have many different players in the system and responses between them. You also have different populations, right, of any any one of those players. And so you sort of have this spatial and temporal complexity and how the relationships can go together. So what do, what do we know about that? I mean, e either in the case of, of hawk moths and, and Datura or, you know, other classic examples yeah. of the, the role of population structure in influencing the outcomes of coevolution. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that was, that's probably the biggest aha moment of my own career. Um, that I won't say that I was blithely ignorant of John Thompson's work because uh, I read I had read his books as a grad student and as a postdoc, but I hadn't really experienced it. Um, first grant I got with Lucinda McDade um, in Arizona was to look at species level diffuse coevolution traits. Like we were interested in the guild of night blooming plants. So think of them as moonflowers or jasmines, like everywhere in the world, uh, you know, whatever it is, 30, 40 families of plants have evolved a kind of jasmine. Mm -hmm. Flower that blooms at night, it's perfumed, you know, it's, it's chalice shaped, it's long tubed, long spurred, you know, like Darwin's orchid or like Detura. And so we had focused on evening primroses, four o'clocks, and tobaccos, which are not only three different families, but they're three different orders. Hmm. You know, so they like really converge in evolution, like different morphological ways to make a nectar tube, mm -hmm. uh, different ways to make a, a flower, essentially, you know, in terms of which, which, which of the four organs that make flowers, you know, was kind of accentuated into the, the, white, cha the white chalice. Um, and they're all perfumed. Uh, so I launched off on my, on my first field trip to collect data for evening primroses. That was one of our focal groups. We were very much thinking on the species level. We had phylogenies that we were working out and we we're gonna look at like, how do you gain and lose these traits when you switch between hawk moth pollination and say bee pollination? You know, do you lose fragrance? Do you, you know, when you go from day, night blooming to day blooming, you know, what are the, what are the, the, the you know, checks and balances? Yeah. Um, and and uh, on my magical mystery tour, I, I drove up, I drove up from Tucson, <laughs> from Tucson to Boise uh, and back. It was 1998. I was in Salt Lake City for the, the Jazz Bulls finals. It was a great time. Oh, uh, fantastic, man. I would have given a lot to see that. <laughs> oh, I was, uh, it was a morgue, man. It was a horrible day for Salt Lake City at game six. Um, I'm, really, I'm a Bulls fan. I was. I would have been very happy. No, I probably got in a lot of trouble. No. Sorry. Right, <laughs> conversation over. Okay, nice no more to sports. You, no more sports. <laughs> I loved Carl Malone. Um, <laughs> and anyway, uh, I, I was everywhere along the way. I was stopping and collecting evening primroses, and they all smelled the same species, Enothera cespitosa, and they all smelled different. And their flower huh. dimensions were different. I could, I could, I could see this on the roadside. And at one point, you know, from Idaho, I called Lucinda and I said we're in trouble. These are not species traits. These are population traits. And I got back to, to Arizona and, and Lucinda and uh, Judy Bronstein said, you know, let's take a closer look at, at John Thompson's work. Um, and, you know, so years later, I met John, I did a sabbatical with John in, in 2014. We had a 10-year, you know, uh, collaboration on his plants, which I, I can talk about later. Yeah. Um, but, but it was an epiphany for me. So here's the idea in a nutshell, right? That um, you have these tight relationships that we've been talking about. So in John's case, uh, he studied um, saxifrage plants, right? So plants in the in genus Lithophragma, little woodland stars, they're very inconspicuous little flowers, um, which are unusually smelly for how small they are, <laughs> okay? Uh, and they smell good, mostly. Um, and they're pollinated by a quasi yucca moth. They're pollinated by this little moth named Grea that uh, either oviposits into the flower with its abdomen and pollinates it by, by its butt, or, uh, you know, drinks, drinks the nectar and then, you know, oviposits into the ovaries from the outside. There are two species of grea. Um, and 
you know, what John basically discovered over several years of really careful work with his students in the Northwest, Idaho, Montana, Eastern Washington, was that the different populations, the relationships looked different. But in some places, Grea's only host plant was lithophragma, and lithophragma's only pollinator was Grea. So they were stuck with each other, and the reciprocal selective pressures there would be very strong. Mm -hmm. um, but in other populations, there were like Eucara plants growing in the same family, and those were an alternate host, you know, for, for Grea moths. And so, you know, lithophragma was off the hook a little bit, right? Because they may not get all of that uh, negative attention from mm -hmm. Grea. Or other populations where um, there were bombillid flies and, and drenid bees, which are legitimate pollinators for small flowers, but they don't carry the weight of, 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 of destroying the, the fruits or the seeds. Mm. Mm. Right. So in those places, you can imagine like that the selection pressures would be really different. Mm -hmm. And the reason and, and the fact that that was what made that so interesting was that it was a scale of kilometers. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that these different kinds of populations were not far apart from each other. Hence the mosaic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, now, here's where the, for me, this becomes really interesting. Again, you know, devil's advocate. I don't care about flowers and pollinators. I'm really interested in something else. OK, so Craig Bankman, at the same time, is doing this gorgeous work on pine cones and their relationships of different kinds of pine trees across the Intermountain West and crossbill birds mm -hmm. who are specialized on, you know, they've got this special tool, yeah. their, 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 their bills, right? So they, they pry open pine cones and they pull out the seeds and eat them, you know, and they cache some of them. And, and so there's seed dispersal agents and seed predators. Mm -hmm. um, so in places where Again, a hotspot, right? Places where the pine, tr the pine species and the crossbill are the only two interacting species, they're, they're going to be very strong reciprocal selective pressures on those guys. Um, but in places where there's red squirrels, red squirrels have a different way of attacking pine cones, mm -hmm. and then the tree, and then the trees are are dealing with those other selective pressures. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and the third example I mentioned before, you know, the Brody's long-term study on garter snakes and and newts that have tetrodotoxin. You know, and, that, and there's clinal variation across the American West in terms of how strong the toxins are, how resistant, you know, the, the garter snakes are to those toxins or how able they are to sequester them and use them for their own defense, et cetera. So imagine you're in the same forest in Idaho, you know, or in Washington or Oregon, and you've got those three systems happening at the same time. You know, that yeah. geographic, geographic mosaics are everywhere, okay? <laughs> so that for me was the oh wow it's like oh these are just beautiful model systems with really you know excellent scientists who promoted them and, and developed them but 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 it's broader than that right we need to be thinking about other you know other examples these are not I think the problem with yuccas you know which I have worked on with the lapel mirror and 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 um, you know Glenn Svensson my first postdoc um, and my friends from Syracuse you know Carrie Segraves and Dave Althoff. Uh, in people's mind, they're too specialized, right? They're like, oh yeah, that's great. But they're off on their own, like figs and fig wasps. You know, they mm -hmm. they're a module in the network. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't interact with everybody else, even, even though they do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, when you broaden your you know, commute, when you include community ecology, when you look at um, geographic differences in microhabitat, you start to create this picture of, oh, it's everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the importance to evolutionary theory geographic mosaics is that it takes microevolution, which most people agree on, you know, I'm, I'm saying about like the lay public, right? Yeah. Microevolution, but it provides a bridge to macroevolution. Yeah. Like, yeah. Here's how microevolution happening locally can actually diversify things that we would count as different species eventually, you mm -hmm. know, and, and one of the big you know, criticisms of evolution is, okay, fine, you know, you can have allele frequency changes here and there, and you, you can even happen in real time in the Galapagos or whatever, but, you know, that doesn't make species A into species B. So, so if I could just click, connect those dots, so if you've got a mosaic where you have sort of slight co-evolved differences among a series of populations, you could think of those as like a bunch of little evolutionary experiments within a species, and, you know, sometimes one of those populations is going to expand out and and replace all the rest, right? And so that, that's the connection between the microevolutionary part and sort of more macroevolutionary diversification, right? That's, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So, and here's where it comes into like movement ecology and population genetics. 
which is yeah. a connection I never would have made originally. <laughs> that that like you know for lithophragma, just to just to play this out, uh, the 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 plant's seed dispersal is by gravity. They don't go anywhere. Hmm. Okay, and the gray moths. Right, and the gray moths apparently don't go anywhere either, which is <laughs> so, why, which is yeah. why the, the, we we discovered this big paper we published in PNAS last year, um, that every population almost you know is different in terms of its floral scent at, mm. at levels that we would expect of of genera or families, not populations. It's like same. a super fine grain mosaic, right? Super fine grain. Uh -huh. in, in contrast, yuccas and yucca moths. Okay, we, we again we have twenty years of data on this. Um, yucca moths move. Yucca fruits used to move when there were giant sloths and mammoths and things around. Um, but, you know, yucca population genetics uh, basically show that there's not a lot of local population partitioning. That's a lot of most of the genetic variation in the studies that have been done is within populations, not between yeah. them. Yeah. And yucca moths, even though they look small to us, they're robust. They can carry pollen balls, you know, several kilometers. And so there's evidence for gene flow. Mm -hmm. and as a result, the floral scent that's so important for getting yucca moths to yucca flowers um, is homogenized. It's much more homogeneous. Yeah, yeah. it's Over, homogenized yeah. across it. you know across whole geographic regions. Got it. Yeah. So huh. I love well, that fantastic. example. Yeah, I love it too. I love that example. Um, well, I, I want to turn now since we're we're moving on in time. I want to talk about a specific paper of yours. Uh, this this recent uh, 2020 paper in Plants, People, and Planet, which um, I think blew me and Marty away. Really loved it. Yeah. Um, and, and I I read actually what I think is one of my favorite sentences that I've ever read in a scientific paper. And I'm just going to quote it here. Quote: I outlined two examples of diffuse coevolution between plants and nocturnal pollinators, hawk moths and bats, to examine their impact on human aesthetic ideals, revealing unexpected links between perfume, tequila, and the art of Georgia O'Keeffe. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so um, I'll just say, so, so very broadly, this paper is about um, the relationship between what we've been talking about so far, coevolution and ecosystem services. And, and so let's just draw that link here for the, the last part of the podcast and maybe start just by telling us what are ecosystem services and then we can connect that back to, to coevolution. Mm. I, I, honestly, I think it goes back to Ehrlich and Raven. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in a different way, though, and, and, I, and, I, and I emphasize this because we all had these formative experiences in our education. Um, so when you and I were at Stanford, um, you know, Peter Raven came and gave this amazing talk to like all of Stanford about um, essentially about ecosystem services, about you know what humans have to benefit from protecting biodiversity. Um, you know, and we had a colleague at the time who was a student, you know, uh, um, Gretchen Daly, you know, who was doing her thesis with, with Paul Ehrlich. And Gretchen worked very hard to try to define, you know, what are the, how do humans derive value from biodiversity, from ecosystem services? And she, you know, she edited a wonderful book about that a couple of years later. And it just stuck in my mind for many years. It's not what I did, you know, for my own career. But, but those are things that I, I was interested in conservation. I, biodiversity is obviously a, a subject that really motivates me. Um, and, and what it comes down to in a nutshell is um, the natural complexity of the planet, the you know, Darwin's tangled bank, um, you know, in a way that's outlined actually quite beautifully in Genesis, uh, creates the Goldilocks zone, right? It creates a habitable planet for humans um, in ways that are almost too numerous to count. You know, food security, climate control, pest control, natural products that provide us with drugs, medicines, perfumes, fibers, dyes, pigments, uh, you know, building materials, um, genetic resources, things that we don't even, we haven't even fully tapped into yet that can help us solve the emerging problems of the Anthropocene. Um, recreation and inspiration, art, uh, escape from the, the stresses of our urban lives or, or, or whatever of our daily stresses. Um, all of these things, again, it's like coevolution, you know, like what's not an ecosystem service mm -hmm. uh, is, is a relevant question. But to me, that conversation, which kind of started with the 1988 book on diversity, on biodiversity that was edited by E.O. Wilson, um, you know, it took me in a, in a direction that I, it was very relevant to my teaching. You know, I think there, there are two examples that everybody uses that are so wonderful. You know, one is the discovery of penicillin, um, you know, which is, game changer in human history, but it wasn't 
like for humans, right? It's about co you know coevolution and escalating arms races between microbes, mm -hmm. um, and, or uh, or TAC polymerase. Okay, so you know late '80s. You know, I'm at Stanford, ready to go to grad school at Michigan, and I'm doing interviews in grad school. And you know, Ken Seitzma at Wisconsin says to me, "Well, there's this new discovery called polymerase chain reaction that's going to change the way we all do things." <laughs> and and he I said, "Nah, I just, nah come on. <laughs> polymerase no, chain no, no, no. reaction? No way. <laughs> no, but but um, <clears throat> you know, as you guys know, like Kerry Mullis, you know, de deserved his Nobel, right? Because because the and, and, and this is, in my mind, like the strongest argument for non-model systems, you know, that- that yeah, super brilliant discovery. TAC mm -hmm. polymerase, for people listening out there who don't know, Thermus aquaticus is this microbe that lives in hot springs, you know, in Yellowstone. Um, and so, uh, because the, the water temperatures are so hot, um, when it does um, DNA replication, uh, it, it, it can't have the normal in a DNA polymerase molecule enzyme, right? Because it would melt at 80 degrees centigrade or whatever those temperatures are. Whereas TAC polymerase, which is named after Thermus aquaticus, you know, is thermally stable, mm -hmm. you know, under a very, very strong and probably quite ancient selective pressure to not melt at those temperatures. Mm -hmm. So Mullis's insight was, oh, um, I can amplify any DNA sequence by putting TAC polymerase in a test tube with those sequences and with the nucleotides themselves and then thermally cycle mm -hmm. up to uh, up to 80 down to 50 or whatever it is. I, I mm -hmm. don't know what the temperature. So, so, so if I could just uh, maybe summarize your argument about the, this connection between coevolution and ecosystem services. So I think, I think what you're saying is that coevolution results in extreme diversification within biological systems and that the end, end points of those coevolutionary processes produce things, you know, compounds or processes that are of benefit to us, right? And so, so we're, we're in a sense, we're, we're the beneficiaries of all this incredible biological diversification. You, you're, and that's opposed to as saying that coevolution necessarily results in, in things that are, are good for us, right? It's more that, that we're benefiting from the total diversity and we can sort of pick and choose among, uh, among the things that we like and that are good for us. Huh. That's, that's right. Let me, let me give you an example from, from kind of arms race, you know, plant herbivore uh, uh, coevolution, and then we'll come back to the Georgia O'Keeffe yeah, um, yeah, comment. Okay. So, and the tequila uh, comment. Yeah, yeah, let's not forget tequila. We're going to talk tequila. <laughs> never forget. No, never forget the tequila. Uh, well, all of, actually, all of this has to do, has a lot to do with Mexico. Uh, I have had a lifelong love affair with Mexico. I, I went when I was 20. I was a beneficiary of a broader impact, you know, NSF grant to um, Carol Horvitz and Doug Chemsky, and they brought me to Veracruz, and I and I blew my I was 20 years old and it blew my mind, mm -hmm. and I learned I learned Spanish and it changed my life, and so um, you know my colleague Judy Becerra, who's who's Mexican and who works at the University of Arizona, has in her career she studied these wonderful plants, um, you know these these trees uh, in the Bursera family that are like hyper diverse in Mexico. Um, and as, as, as a lot of people know, they have these resins that are under pressure. They're like squirt guns, you know? So if a, if a, if a beetle snips a leaf, it gets squirted in the face with this latex and resin, and it's, which is full of monoterpenes. So, you know, she's done these gorgeous studies to, to sort of show like the tit for tat coevolution and the geographic mosaic parts and the, and the ecological fitting of different communities that can have one, two to five species of, you know, of bursera trees in the same place. And they have this escalating arms races with different species of, um, of, of flea beetles, right? mm -hmm. mullet beetles. And so where that becomes interesting in human history is that that family, the Berseraceae in Mesoamerica, the genus Bursera and the genus Proteum, they're the source of copal. So if you read about the Maya, you know, copal is their incense, okay? It's their connection to the spirit world. And there was a whole trade route, there's a whole economy based on cacao seeds and copal and quetzal feathers that was mm -hmm. moved across Mesoamerica out of the rainforest into the Valley of Mexico, up toward the border with you, you know, with present United States, et cetera. And so pre pre-Columbian Mesoamerica had this whole not only economy, but also the the sort of their spiritual, you know, worldview, which was sort of linked to copal. And that huh. 
And if that were limited to Mexico, that would be fascinating in itself. But the, the, the killer for me is across the planet, okay, what's the close, you know, what are the relatives of Bursera and Proteum? They're, um, you know, they're, they're Camifora and Boswellia, okay? These are genera of very species rich genera of trees in Africa and the Middle East. Guess what they make? They make frankincense and myrrh. Okay? <laughs> so we go back to the Bible, right? And say like, here's, a, you know, the queen of Sheba's whole existence, right? Her, her economy, her relationship with, with King Solomon, like all of that horn of Africa flow of people and money and commerce was about frankincense and myrrh because those trees grow in the horn of Africa and in Yemen. Um, mm -hmm. And they're fighting the same family of beetles and they're producing really similar resins. And so here's where like in one species, it would be cool. But when you have a hundred of them and, and, all, and that represents this arms race and they escape and radiate, then people can take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. right? you know, shaped human history. Frankincense yeah. and, and myrrh, like just pick your culture, right? Like the Greeks wouldn't go into battle with the Persians without myrrh in their pocket because it was a way of you know, of preventing sepsis in their wounds, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, the um, Catholic Church buys up most of the frankincense that they can because it's so important to their rituals in, you know, in the Vatican. Uh, wow. And it, go, it goes back thousands of years. And so from a, if you were just taking a Paul Feeney, you know, point of view of like insects, plants, chemistry, the Bursaraceae is magnificent, but look at how it affected humanity. And, and that's like, I'm, I'm cherry picking a nice example, but you can go on and on and on. Um, you know, when I wrote that sentence, you, you could have asked me, well, what was I smoking, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but potential but, answers. <laughs> but, but, but the, but the Solanaceae, right? The, um, you know, the, the, night, the nightshade family is all about that. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, chemical factories. Yeah. Yeah. Driven by, you know, coevolution with their enemies, you know, yeah. whether it's tropane alkaloids or whether it's nicotine or whatever. And so, like, I, I just find that so inspiring. Um, Peter Raven, to give him credit, invited me to this uh, symposium. Why did I write this paper? Peter, Peter invited me to the symposium on plants at the National Geographic uh, a year ago. And his point of view was, we're plant blind. Plant blindness is a huge problem, even among scientists. And the National Geographic was only funding a small percentage of, of proposals to, to botanists. And so Peter brought together all these different kinds of experts on botany and, and plants um, to, to, for the symposium to basically promote to the National Geographic, here are the sundry and various ways that plants are important. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, Meg Lohman, for example, was our, one of our speakers, and she's like promoted the biodiversity of the canopy and, and getting up into the canopy and getting students into the canopy and getting scientists access to the outrageous, unexpected biodiversity of forest canopies around the world, uh, including Ethiopia. Um, where these, you know, where these trees grow that I was just talking about. So uh, again, Peter, you know, is this huge inspiration for me. And then they asked us to write these papers. And I was challenged, especially in that audience, you know, to bring together as many examples as I could. Yeah. Um, it almost seems like, you know, ecosystem services is a misnomer for the magnitude of what these are to have such profound through such a long period of human evolutionary history to have the impacts that these outcomes of coevolution are. Rob, you should come up with a new a new term for this because we know biology always needs more more words. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> but it, you know, ecosystem <laughs> services sort of, sort of bends it within a, a relatively small window of time, yeah. and this has this legacy impact. That I mean, it's you know, you well, just briefly rattled off five or six different examples, but easily this could be books, right? Well, I think I think that's the point, right? Thank you for that bridge. That that that, that it's not just. It's not just about the air we breathe and the food we eat, and you know, like that gets into a certain realm of, of conversations like with utilities, with, right? With economists, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Um, there's also the issue of inspiration. Mm -hmm. You know, where does where does where does your where do your stories come from? Where does your culture come from? Where does your religion come from? You know, you can't. None of these things happen without natural products and without the the the, the flow of people and ideas and commerce that were driven by these. Goods. I mean, the discovery, like I went to Yale, okay, who's Eli Yale? You know, Eli Yale was a trader in spices, um, you know, and the East India Company. Uh, and, and like, 
I, I'm a big fan of, of 1491 and 1492, um, 1493, right? Uh, those beautiful books about how the world changed after contact. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the spice trade drove all of that for good, bad, and indifferent. Um, so I, I think, you know, again and again, if you, uh, obviously I have, I have biological lenses through which I look at life, right. but, but, you know, cultures would be pretty grim um, <laughs> without, without, <laughs> without the wonders of the natural world, even the ones that are borrowed. You know, we just had um, the, the, the feast of Santa Lucia in Sweden, which is really important, bigger than Christmas, I think for a lot of Swedes. Um, and one of the things that, that Swedes do to celebrate Lucia is, is they make these saffron buns. But that's amazing, right? Because saffron doesn't grow. <laughs> right? Saffron. You don't think Sweden for sure. <laughs> no, no, but, but, but that leads us to a, to a biological puzzle. What is saffron? Why is saff saffron is extremely expensive? Um, you know, it, it's grown in Iran and it's grown in Spain and, and Morocco, not in many other places. And what is it? It's a crocus. Uh, and saffron comes from what? It comes from the female organ of a flower. It has to be plucked, you know, by hand, which is why it's so damn expensive. Mm -hmm. but, but 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 the saffron owls, right? Those compounds, they're they're sawed up. They're they're the decapitated, literally the, the head part of a beta carotene molecule or these pigment molecules, carotenoids. So what are they doing? You know, are they protecting the plant? Are they signal molecules? Do they are they antimicrobial? You know, do they assist in pollen tube generation? We don't even know. <laughs> it's the same with vanillin. You know, orchids are not famous for fruit. Most orchid fruits are dry capsules with millions of little tiny, you know, dust-like seeds. So what is the vanilla orchid? So we don't know why we have vanilla. We don't speaking. know why we have vanilla. No. That's nuts. But the Listeners world... out there, you must get on this. <laughs> oh, I mean, here's, <laughs> one of, here's one of my messages. Like, like we're never going to run out of questions for, for students out there across the planet. You know, I know your global reach of your, of your podcast. Um, listening to us, uh, like there's don't don't despair. There's some plenty of great questions out there that we have no, no clue of what the answers are. Um, but I think you know, bringing it back to the Georgia O'Keeffe and the tequila part. Um, okay, I, here's why like night blooming plants, which I love, are are so amazing. You know, we appear to have similar tastes in terms of our olfactory sensory you know, uh, proclivities to, to hawk moths. Flowers that are pollinated by hawk moths are our favorite perfumes, you know, jasmine and gardenia and, and jonquils and things. So they're sweet and pleasant to us. Poly you know, flowers pollinated by dung flies and, and carrion flies, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> There's a big market for those perfumes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so the fact that the flowers have to produce a lot of scent to attract moths from a distance is part of their diffuse coevolution. Right, because they're going to attract moths to, to, to in, in, in cases like Darwin's orchid is an epiphyte. You don't find fields of Darwin's orchid; you find individual plants. So they have to have strong scent to bring moths across a distance to find them. Moths are nearsighted, and so they can't just see those flowers from a kilometer away. But they can smell them from hundreds of meters away. Um, so, 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 so the perfume part, the Georgia O'Keeffe part, you know, what we derive as beautiful, these large moon flowers that are very sexy, right? They're very sensual and they smell great. They inspire us. That's an artifact of what it is to inspire a hawk moth, okay? And to attract a hawk moth over distance, whether it's in a rainforest or a desert. So, so th this is super interesting to me. So, so do you think that uh, it's just chance that that outcome of that coevolutionary interaction is so attractive to us? Or, or are you claiming that there's some kind of like cultural or actual human evolution in response to these really important plants that make them so attractive to us? Um, Does that question make sense? Question. It, it, it does, but especially in the context of um, domestication. Okay, so, so one of the really interesting things to do is to ask, what happens to Easter lilies and gardenias and jasmines in the last 2,000 years, you know, the last 200 years? You know, in human demand. So we like those plants, obviously. And there's no church altar on Easter that's bereft of, you know, 20 or 30 pots of, of Easter lilies, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and different cultures around the world, you know, in, in the, if you read the, um, the, the, the Thousand and One Nights, for example, 
you know, in Damascus um, was full of gardens. Ancient Damascus was full of gardens of jasmine and citrus. You know, so people have been growing those plants for their fragrances for a long time. Um, as I mentioned in the article, you know, uh, the Sun King in, in France grew tuberose from Mexico all, you know, in Versailles because it smelled great. Um, so the question is like, if, if you remove things from natural selection and put them in artificial selection, do they shift? You know, does, does the fragrance become more sweet and less, and less funky? Um, are there things that, as we've learned from, you know, Ian Baldwin's group's beautiful work on, on wild tobaccos, are there parts of those fragrance components that are actually defensive and not attractive that like flowers don't just attract pollinators, they also attract enemies. And so maybe the full bouquet of fragrance includes things that are, you know, off-putting to uh, wood crickets and to, you know, opportunistic flower visitors that, you know, rob nectar rather than you know, the pollinators that they're kind of targeting. Um, so I, I think that's one answer to your question. Um, the tequila part, which we, we really have to get we to. We got to get to it. Let's, let's go there now. <laughs> Don't leave out tequila. We've we got we, we, we to do it. Yeah. So, so this, this comes from one of my colleagues, Luis Aguiarte from UNAM in Mexico, and, and his, his team, a wonderful team of, of scientists that worked with him and his wife for many, many years um, on agaves and on bats. And their idea is that bats and agaves have been engaged in an arms race of a different kind, um, that bats are you know, much larger than most other pollinating animals except for birds and their energetic demands are also very high. So they need a lot of sugar. They need a lot of nectar. Um, and so smaller flowers with small nectar, you know, rewards, like even like hawk moth flowers, which are compared to bee flowers, like very rich in nectar, are not sufficient to feed bats. Bats often fly up to 100 miles in a night from their cave to find flowers, which is outrageous to think of. Mm. But we, we know this is true now from studies where people have put radio tags on bats and followed them mm -hmm. in their caves. Um, so the arms race idea is that for bats to show flower constancy, um, you know, you have, you have to make it worth their while. Like you have to have these like mass blooming cacti, columnar cacti or, or agaves um, that, that, that offer like liters of nectar in aggregate um, to satisfy these bats. Cause you don't get one bat, right? You, you have a whole cave full of bats mm -hmm. and they move and they, and they migrate. Um, and so the idea is that, is that Competing for bats drove agaves to this kind of, you know, almost suicidal production of, 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 of giant candelabras of flowers. And, and because they're desert plants, right? Um, and they're cam plants, they can only do photosynthesis. They can only like fix carbon at night. They can't grow very fast. They're limited by their form of photosynthesis and by the severity of the climate in which they live. You know, so basically they've, They've been driven to be like salmon, where they can only afford one explosive reproductive, you know, bout, and then they die. You know, it, it's like a Norse mythology, right? Like they, they, they die in this burning boat. You know, they go out with this, they go out with this huge bang. Um, and so, tequila is not made from agave flowers. It's made from the, the the sugar reserves in the rosette, in the plant, in the vegetative part of the plant. But the idea is in order to make the asparagus, you know, the giant you know, 25 to 35 foot tall flowering panicle that agaves make, you have to marshal incredible amounts of stored photosynthate. And what Mesoamericans discovered is if you harvest before they bloom, if you harvest a large agave plant, cut off the thorny part, and you're left with this big artichoke, and then you squeeze it, that's what becomes mezcal and tequila once you ferment it. It's an mm -hmm. incredible source of sugar and carbohydrate. And you know, if you travel in Latin America, all along South America and Central America, you know, there's always a place where somebody's doing a chicha, right? A chicha is a fermented starch. Mm -hmm. So whether it's whether it's potato or whether it's corn-based or whether it's cassava-based, you know, you have the starch source and people chew it. And the amylases in their saliva, you know, digest the or metabolize the starch into sugars, and then you can ferment the sugars, and then it becomes a spirit, and then that becomes your bridge to the spirit world. 
right? Mm -hmm. And and so to you know tequila and mezcal, you know, obviously served that purpose long before the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors. And today, it's a huge. Not only is it like one of those things that North Americans think of when they think of Mexico, but also for the Mexican economy, it's really important. And mm -hmm. so so what what Luis Ayarte and his colleagues have written is are these beautiful papers saying, hey, you know what? Um, bats are in trouble. Uh, they are a traveling feast, right? They migrate. They're not always in places where they can be protected. They're very sensitive to pathogens and to uh, industrial pollution and, and to predation and so forth. Um, and, uh, and so why don't, why don't if, if, if you're, if you're a, a tequila farmer, if you, if you have fields and fields and fields of agave, um, and you don't want them to bloom, right? Because what you want to do is you harvest, you want to harvest the pulque from, from the, from the rosette. Mm -hmm. let, a, let a couple of them bloom every year, you know, promote the bats. Save the bats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So grow an extra border row and just let those guys bloom. And it's a long-term thing. It's not going to happen next year, right? It's going to take 30 years. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but, but give migrating bats a chance where if, you know, if, if you have, you know, every time, you know, the, if you scale up industrially, your pulqueria, at least could you have a border of plants that you let bloom so that the bats coming through won't snort. So is that suggesting getting any traction? Or I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just read the paper before, you know, giving my presentation. I was at a conference last fall in Mexico, um, in Querétaro, which had a, a wonderful symposium on the Anthropocene. You know, what are the, what are the threats to biodiversity and to ecology in Mexico and in the Americas? In, in a larger yeah, scale, yeah. Uh, having to do with human activities, yeah. uh, the mo you know monarch migrations, the wall, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. we, we had a weirdly similar conversation with Dave Goulson yesterday, and uh, talked about uh, how to promote bee and insect diversity. And he was telling us about these um, th these these moves to ask farmers. It was a big experiment that they did, I think, in the UK, where they had farmers take out three or eight percent of their arable land and sort of convert it back into wild grassland with lots of flowers. And I guess there was initial hit in production of the crops, but then within five years or so on, on less total land devoted to the crop, they got just as much uh, production as they did before because there was so much more pollinator diversity and no pollen limitation in the, in the crops. So that's, you know, that's, that's a problem. And, and it's really worth, worth discussing broadly because a lot of sustainability, you know, more natural, ecologically natural ways of dealing with some of these problems um, take time. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and it's not an to fix. And economics doesn't yeah. work. You know, it's not, it's not very um, hospitable to that. I'll, you know, a good example is the push pull uh, agricultural system in Kenya mm -hmm. okay, that, that Zaire Khan and, and uh, John Pickett have promoted over their careers. You know, it takes four or five years for that intercropping system to start turning a profit. But then it goes, you know, ballistic, right? Because because you're also not you're not only controlling pests, but you're also uh, reducing pesticide use, and you're returning nitrogen to the soil without using um, industrial fertilizer. Mm -hmm. and so in the Those in the long term, yeah. it's a long in the long term, it's a beautiful thing to do. But for the first three or four years, you really have to subsidize those farmers yeah. for investing in the method, mm -hmm. and that's often a hard sell, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. Of multinational companies and, and, and so forth, sure. Yeah. Um, seed companies. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think that's that's probably you know, and that's beyond my depth in terms of my own personal training and professional training. But I, I see that as a common problem that uh, sustainable solutions require several years to kick in. Uh, but we don't tend to live that way. You know, our politics and our you know our global um, uh, challenges tend to to, to happen on a, on a faster time scale. Yeah. Yeah. Rob, this has been fantastic. And um, we want to start wrapping up by talking about your future um, in terms of the, the research that you've got coming down the, the, uh, the road. I mean, with, with regard to floral sense or co-evolution of, of its many forms, what's next for you? Oh, thank you. I, so um, I've neglected to mention a wonderful project uh, that we've been working on for about 12 years now. Um, it's a big collaboration, but the primary collaborator has been um, Chris Escogan from the Chicago Botanic Garden. Um, and um, it, we were funded through the Dimensions of Diversity uh, program at NSF, mm -hmm. which was amazing. You know, five years, a couple million dollars, big teams, 
lots of PIs, uh, a couple of postdocs. Uh, the part I'm going to talk about was driven by Tanya Yogesh, so lead postdoc um, in, uh, in the floral scent part of the, of the project. But we were looking at evening primroses across Western North America, so from a kind of geographic mosaic point of view, but, but scaling up from populations to phylogenies and mm. asking, you know, uh, what are the relationships between floral scent, night blooming, moth pollination, and uh, geographic variation. And what we found, the paper I'm writing literally right now, <laughs> um, is, is, a, is one rare species of, of evening primrose in Colorado called um, Enothera harringtonii. Uh, we know all, the, all of its populations, it's a rare plant. Uh, and, and Colorado, um, you know, the state of Colorado has kept, kept track of this plant because it's, it's an endemic. Um, but it's like a gardenia, you know, it, it literally smells like a gardenia. The, the fragrance is incredible. Uh, and it's in the, it's a short grass prairie plant that comes up to the foothills of the Rockies in places like Colorado Springs and Pueblo. Mm -hmm. um, what we found was fascinating is that it's, um, it's got a geographic mosaic for um, the, the, the scent compound that I studied as a graduate student, linalol. So this is kind of the, the smell of Earl Grey tea, you know, bergamot mm -hmm. oil. Um, and you can smell it with your nose, like in certain populations, you'll smell it and you say, oh, yeah, that smells like gin. It doesn't smell <laughs> like you know, Earl Grey tea. And that's because the linalol is not there. And the gin smell is osamine, which is like one of the beetles' greatest hits of coral scent. Um, so what we discovered over many years, lab studies, field studies, you know, manipulative studies, correlative studies, is that uh, the same pollinators are, and herbivores are, are present everywhere. So it's not a geographic mosaic in terms of the players. Um, but what we find is that further out into the prairie, uh, there's less and less frequency of linalol bearing plants. They, they smell, they don't smell like Earl Grey tea. Um, mm. And in those places, um, this little yucca moth like moth in the genus Mompha, which does not pollinate, it's very small, but it lays eggs into the flower uh, and into the fruit, and, and, and its caterpillars eat seeds in the fruits like yucca moth. So highly caterpillars. destructive to plant fitness. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that they're apparently they're attracted to linalol. Mm. So the populations where linalol is rare, uh, those plants get hammered. You know, there's a very strong selective pressure against linalol. Mm. Populations where linalol is common, the moths appear to be using something else to choose their host plant. Um, mm. And so that was like, that was amazing to us because this is a, a, a canonical feature of moth pollinated, you know, jasmine-like plants. It's a strong, sweet scent. And the, and the hawk moths, in this case, the white line sphinx, doesn't care. The flowers are scented either, either way, and adding linalol to the flowers didn't change anything hmm. um, in terms of hawk moth attraction. But, but, but the, the seed predator did care. So in this case, we have a geographic mosaic. It's a really steep climb around Waltenburg you know, along the interstate, um, uh, where they go from smelling like jasmines and gardenias to smelling like, you know, gin. <laughs> and so that, you know, is a wonderful experience for us. And, and, and scaling that up across the genus in the entire West, Utah, Wyoming, Idaho, New Mexico, Arizona, in Southern California, we see really similar patterns. Um, and that maybe what, what's happening in Enothera is that evolutionary shifts to and away from hawk moth pollination may be about getting away from mompha. Hmm. You bloom in the day or if you're self-pollinating really or if you lose your scent, maybe it's a way to reduce selective pressure by your enemy. Hmm. And, and, and that's potentially profound because we don't think of, of plant pollinator evolution necessarily, if pollinator shifts from hummingbird, you know, from, from beetle to bee or from hawk moth to bird, we don't always think about those things being driven by enemies. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so huh. it's um, about attracting the pollinator, not about, you know, right. not attracting like the getting enemy. away from the one, you don't want. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you huh. know, Ian, Ian Baldwin and, and Danny Kessler and, and their colleagues showed this, you know, beautifully in a wild tobacco a couple of years ago, it's not a species level shift, but what they found was that when Manduka caterpillars are eating the plants, one of the induced responses of these tobacco plants is to actually change the timing of their flowers and the scent of their flowers so that they bloom at dawn instead of dusk and that they don't smell the same way. And so that they're, they're kind of shifting to hummingbird pollination as, a, as an herbivore, as a response to herbivory. That was amazing. That's I pretty read, awesome. <laughs> I, I, I read that paper and I reviewed it and I was like, oh, 
don't, <laughs> don't I wish I had done this. This is, this is gorgeous. Um, so I, it, it just got us thinking in a broader sense of like, how often does that happen? You know, how often are pollinator shifts a consequence of getting, just getting rid of enemies? You yeah. know, yeah. bloom, in, bloom in the day, you know, to get rid of your scent, you know, change your pigment. Um, or, you know, not, instead of switching pollinators, switching to a mixed mating system where you can self-pollinate in the bud. And if, you, yeah. if, everything, if everything gets eaten, you still can put seeds in the ground. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. right. Uh, that's so cool. Well, hey, Rob, let's, let's do one more sort of crystal ball question. So um, we step back from, you know, your individual projects and um, plant insect coevolution, and we had to just sort of take a broad view of chemical ecology, and you were to look into your crystal ball and think forward five or 10 years. You know, what do you, what do you see coming down the pipe as the big questions, and are there, are there new technologies that are going to revolutionize how we're understanding you know scent-based communication which obviously we humans are very poor at having an intuition about because our noses are so bad so yeah i i think um you know i have a colleague here at cornell named frank schroeder who um, is a pioneer in in using nmr to rapidly nuclear magnetic resonance to to, to rapidly screen for chemistry um so you can actually identify blends um, you know, our, our colleagues at the University of Nevada, Reno, are doing that, you know, beautifully in their studies of, of, of piper plants, you know, in pepper, pepper family, um, you know, in Costa Rica and in, and in Peru. Um, so I think, you know, this sort of broader, un, un, untargeted screening of chemistry is, is, is really helping chemical ecology to enter the informatics age and to uh, dovetail a little better with genomics um, and with. Are we, we going to have the odorome of different places? I mean, oh, we already <laughs> do. Yeah, yeah. No, there are, there are people. There are people who are doing beautiful studies in French Guiana or in or in Borneo of um, you know resin ohms. You know, like what are the what are the if you if you wound if you walk a transect through a rainforest and you wound the the trunk and you get resins, what are, what's the chemistry of those resins? Mm -hmm. um, and how does that connect, you know, Sarah Leonhardt did this beautiful study I can't get enough of, um, of, of these uh, stingless bees in, in Borneo that, that visit trees for resin for their nests. And the resin has different chemistry and, the, and they're really interested in that chemistry because it's, they're, they're antimicrobial, right? Their nests don't get, don't get microbial spoilage. And so, you know, she made this network of, of resin chemistry with bee, you know, foraging and bee visitation. It's just gorgeous. You know, that, that, that it, it's taken, as, as you know, I mean, my career has been kind of trying to be the Johnny Appleseed for chemistry and pollination. Um, and, I, and it's been an uphill battle because people are really interested in color. People are really interested in, you know, in networks. And, and um, I've had to work very hard, I think, to persuade some of my colleagues that, that chemis chemistry could drive network structure. Um, you know, I, I worked with, a, um, you know, Theodora Patanidou and her student, um, uh, uh, Aphrodite Kansa in Greece on this just amazing study that I'm so proud to have been a part of where like we looked at this complex plant pollinator network in the island of Lesbos uh, before it was destroyed, you know, by Syrian refugees and, and the problems in that part of the world. Um, uh, and the network was, the structure of the network was like profoundly influenced by color odor combinations. And we discovered that by, in, in a non-biased way, by letting the data tell us and got crunching, you know, multivariate statistics and asking like, what are the, what are the nodes? Where mm -hmm. are the branches? Mm -hmm. and, and so like, I mean, that's what's good about science, right? That, that whatever motivates us, you know, we all accept the idea that, you know, the burden of proof is on novelty. If you come up with a new idea, you have to have better evidence to persuade people not to change the old idea. Yeah. And so, I don't resent that, you know, having, having kind of promoted oral scent and chemistry for 25 years, um, it's challenged me to, to be a better scientist and say, don't focus on these night blooming plants that I love, but work in collaboration with other systems and other plants and really try to make the case or be convinced myself that it's important in plants that don't bloom at night and, and have long distance pollinators. And, you know, the short answer, which is very gratifying is yeah, it's important. It's important. <laughs> important everywhere, man. <laughs> Loving that. <laughs> this is this is good. So, um, 
I, we always end the, the shows with a chance for you to tell us something that you wanted to say that we didn't give you the, the platform to say. So is there anything else research wise, big picture, you know, advice to graduate students, anything under the sun that you'd like to say? Or moon. Or moon, oh, as it were. You know, um, <laughs> I, I think that the, the, the students, students are uh, really struggling right now. The world is changing so rapidly and it's hard for them to plan their careers the way that we could plan our careers um, in terms of decades. It's stupid to, to plan a decade from now. God knows where we'll all be. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and so I think it's easy to, you know, to lose heart. Um, I was so, I, I began, we began this discussion by talking about Bates and Wallace. You know, I, I grew up as a child wanting to explore and to discover that I became a scientist and a professor because of the joy of discovery and, and the chance to participate in that. It's an incredible honor um, and privilege that, that by having parents who supported my education, I got to do uh, and continue. I have a great job now and I, and I really value that job. Mm-hmm. But I would, you know, um, I have a senior colleague named Ring Carday who's been wonderful to me over the years, University of um, California, Riverside. And I had a conversation with him after the, after the recession in 2008 and nine uh, where I was a little despondent about grant money. And uh, I had asked Ring um, a little, you know, <laughs> apolitically, you know, how did he survive previous um, tough experiences in, you know, economic downturns and recessions, and, you know, problems with funding, et cetera. And he said something really profound to me. He said, you know, um, I think there's a kind of Newtonian law about money and resources that you can't create or destroy it, it, is, it, it goes somewhere. Um, and that in his experience as a scientist, you know, one of the challenges was you know, if, to remain a scientist, to remain funded, to, to, to be able to continue to do what we do, is that one of your daily, weekly, monthly, yearly challenges is, is, is find support, find ways to support what you do. A decade ago, we never talked about, you know, you fund me or go fund me. Mm-hmm. Um, but what Ring basically said is like, we were studying dates you know, and, 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 date poll- and date pollination and date weevils in Southern California. It was an important local growth, you know, industry, and we had USDA funding to do it, and that went away, but we still had these relationships with the date farmers, and so we got together, and we actually made a consortium, um, and we, we, wrote, we, we had lawyers, and we wrote contracts. We were able hmm. to still find cool resources and find money to continue doing that important research and to support students, and what, it was just a, like a wonderfully positive, resilient, gritty thing, you know, advice for him to share with me as a junior colleague, like don't despair, you know, nobody gets NSF funding forever, you know, nobody gets, you know, you know the same programs I like to mention, so it's, it's going to go away, yeah. um, you know, and, but so, but the, but the idea is, look, man, if you have good ideas, if you're creative, if you are good at talking to other people and getting them excited about what you do, there's going to be other ways, there's got to be other ways to continue to make, you know, discovering um, and creating knowledge, what we do is apolitical, right? We create knowledge and other people can use it for good or for bad. There's all kinds of examples in both ways, but I didn't grow up thinking that. I grew up thinking I want to discover. I, you know, that makes me so happy. Um, it, it, it makes all the hard work so worthwhile. And to share that with a student or a postdoc or with your colleagues, and to share that across cultures with our colleagues in other countries, you know, despite language barriers and political barriers and economic barriers, is is the gift of my life you know mm-hmm. that when i whenever the end comes and i look back on you know what did i enjoy it's, those are the, those are more important than publications or whatever it's the feeling that that science allowed me to meet people from all across the world and to find mm-hmm. common ground and to know like i grew up you know like my friend from japan grew up catching butterflies like me you know my, my friend from morocco grew up smelling herbs in his mother's food just the way my italian grandparents did for me mm-hmm. and you know my friends in, in in Argentina got excited about hawk moths the way that I did and the, during the magic hour of sunset um, that to me is so precious uh, that that and I'll go down swinging <laughs> you know <laughs> awesome. to, to, to defend the the chance to do that and what I've tried to share that not only with my students but also with my own children you know by by, by traveling to with them and by bringing friends from other colleagues from other countries to my own home mm-hmm. and by, sh- by showing them like people from other countries aren't enemies, right? Yeah. <laughs> like they're just like you. 
uh, and, and, and thanks to them, they speak English and you can actually talk to them. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank, that's, that's amazing. I mean, we need, we need mindsets like that now. It's really refreshing to hear. So thank, thank you for that. Well, I, I need it to wake up in the morning, frankly. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we, all, we all need inspiration. The gathering of our time. <laughs> we need coevolutionary inspiration. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Rob. This has been a really yeah, great thank you, conversation. Rob. And uh, just love, love talking about this stuff. Thank, thanks to all of you. This has been a lot of fun. Um, some, some, some good fun on a, on a dark day. Um, but uh, <laughs> there's always, there's always a sunrise and a sunset and then <laughs> sunset brings night blooming flowers and hawk moth. So I, I've always got something to report to. <laughs> and if everything goes to hell, there's always mezcal. So yeah, there you, go. <laughs> <laughs> you said that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but when you know when you look at the license plate of New Mexico and you see the soap tree yucca, you can think of coevolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> there, there, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be in awesome. touch as this progresses, Rob. Um, and we get close to sort of release date, we'll probably have some correspondence with you about uh, photos and uh, just uh, coordinate social media. Put